is calling Whenever I'm together with the gold bucks crawling Praise to the man who stands so fat And fights so quick and as fast as lightning An older gentleman decided to spend his day fishing on November 17, 1971. It was a beautiful fall day and there was no better way to spend it. So he drove down a country road to Turner Bayou, just north of Galveston, parked his truck near a oil pump and walked to the water. He threw his line into the water and noticed something very bizarre in the water, just off the bridge that looked like a woman's wig, only attached to what he at first thought was a wig, appeared to be human skin. He quickly headed back to his truck, drove to the nearest store, and called authorities. Police quickly flooded the area. They got ropes in order to reel the body in, and on closer inspection, the dead girl had long, dark, reddish-brown hair. She wore only a pink bra under a maroon blouse, pierced earrings, and rings. From the waist down, she was nude. The first officers on the scene noted what appeared to be bullet wounds. Authorities knew pretty quick who the girl was and knew possibly in that same area another dead girl would be found. So they began to search. I see something, a Texas City fireman shouted when he spotted skin protruding from the water 150 feet downstream from the small wooden bridge where the first body had been found. There in the tall grass around the bayou's marshy edge, all that was visible was the naked buttocks of a young girl face down in the water. The corpse again was nude from the waist down and had on a bra with a dark purple band line type shirt with a zipper up the front. Both girls' wrist and ankle had been bound with black cords. Officers knew exactly who these girls were and dreaded telling their families the horrible news. The two girls, both 15, were Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson. In 1971, Galveston residents Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson were only 15 years old and were best friends. The pair shared a love for surfing, hanging out with friends, swimming near the seawall in Galveston, and were regulars at Wicks Ski School. Debbie Ackerman was the youngest of the three siblings. She had two older brothers and was the apple of her dad's eyes. Debbie's parents were German immigrants, but Debbie was born on the island. Her dad was a janitor, and her mom was a supply clerk. Debbie was an outgoing girl with an athletic build. During the summer of 71, she had actually won her first trophy in a surfing contest. Maria Johnson had just moved to Galveston just the previous year, in fact. Her father was a gynecologist, but she decided to come stay with her mother and her new stepfather in the Galveston area. Maria loved to collect antique glass bottles that she would find at the beach and then bring them home to set in her bedroom window. They attended Ball High School and both had just started dating boys that went to the school. On Saturday, November 13, 1971, Debbie had a spat with her mom when she wanted to spend the weekend at Maria's rather than stay home and help her mother clean, which I can't blame her. Her mom, Dee, was upset with Debbie for wanting to hang out with Maria all the time anyway. She thought that Maria was a little too experienced in the boy department. So Maria decided to get her way, like a lot of teens do, and ask her dad for permission, and he said yes. There was no school on Monday, November 15th, so on Sunday night, Debbie called her dad and said, Dad, can I please stay one more night? He said, okay, but be home by 315th. By lunch that day, the girls were walking down the street, Debbie holding her small suitcase in her hand, when two of their friends who worked at Baskin Robbins called them over for a chat. The friends asked them what they were doing. They replied, nothing. And the two girls, who were actually on their lunch break, they had to go back. So she told Debbie and Maria their lunch break was over and they would see them later. As the two girls turned to leave, they seen a white van pull over with a man in it talking to them and noticed that Maria and Debbie hopped in the van with him. As he was pulling away, the girls did notice the white van had curtains over the back window blocking the view, which at the time they thought was kind of strange. 
but no warning signs went off. The appointed time, 3.15, came and went, and Debbie failed to return home as she had promised. At about 4, D. Ackerman contacted Maria's mother, looking for Debbie. The calls continued into the evening, but the Johnsons insisted that they had nothing to tell her. They hadn't seen Maria either. In fact, the last time they'd seen the girls was that morning just after 9 a.m. when the Johnsons said goodbye and left for work. They had no idea where their daughter and her best friend could be. The following morning, Tuesday, the girls were still missing and their parents were growing increasingly apprehensive. Maria's father notified the Texas Rangers and the Ackermans called their sons home from college to help them look for the girls. Then November 17th is the day that the fishermen have found the bodies of Debbie and Maria. On November 23rd, at 8 in the morning on the same day, Debbie was laid to rest. A man yielding a metal detector walked through a heavy wooded area near the Attics Reservoir, west of Houston and just north of I-10. Rather than buried treasure, what the man found was a decapitated, decomposing body. In the era long before cell phones existed, the man drove to the nearest neighbors. A call went out and police responded. One of the first discoveries was a skull a short distance away in the underbrush. Based on items found on the corpse, a white knit pullover and striped slacks and a ring that read love, it was quickly assumed that the decomposing body belonged to Gloria Ann Gonzalez, the 19-year-old Kroger bookkeeper who had been missing for nearly a month. That same day, the remains were transported to the morgue for autopsy. The Emmy noticed something odd. While the body remained covered with decomposing flesh, the skull was nearly skeletal. Why would the skull be nearly cleaned off and not the body? Could animals have devoured all the tissues off the skull? Perhaps, but he saw no sign of such animal activity. And if that was the cause, why hadn't they attacked the body as well? Gonzalez's mandible remained with her body and he inspected it carefully. Decades before DNA mapping in criminal cases, dental records played the most important role in IDing a person. Along with the jawbone, the doctor examined teeth found on the scene. Some were still attached. The others found near the body he carefully inserted into the bone to reconstruct the lower jaw to aid in matching it to Gonzalez's dental x-ray. When he picked up a molar, however, he suddenly had a problem. The tooth didn't fit the jaw. He immediately knew there is another body out there. Authorities went back to the crime scene and soon spotted a pile of bones on a bed of decaying leaves 50 yards from the flags that marked the spot where searchers had recovered Gonzalez. This corpse wore a ring that said peace on it and they knew immediately it was the body of Colette Wilson. Through the years, bodies would continue to pile up in what is now called the Texas Killing Fields. There were many suspects through the years, but in 1998, a man who was already incarcerated for another murder would write letters taking credit for 11 murders in the killing fields, describing them as the 11 who went to heaven. That man was Edward Howard Bell. Ed Bell was born in Houston. His father, Carl Clayton Bell, was an East Texas oil field worker and his mother a housewife. He had one brother, Larry, who was two years older. They moved often following Clayton's latest job, but by junior high, he had settled on a ranch in New Ulm, a small town a little more than an hour west of Houston, outside of Columbus. Young Ed Bell was a young man who focused on his studies and concentrated on bettering his life. It was a typical American family. During Ed Bell's impressionable childhood years, his family witnessed a shocking act of violence when Bell's cousin reportedly killed his own father. Ed Bell would later contend that their uncle was torturing his wife at the time, forcing water down her throat, and his son shot him to make him stop. After graduating high school in 1957, Ed attended Texas A&M. He majored in physical education and minored in biology. His grades in high school had been really good, but in college turned average. Maybe he was spending too much time worrying about women because in college he met his first wife, Bonnie. Over the years, Bonnie and Ed had three children, but in 1966, Ed was arrested for exposing himself to young girls. Then after moving with his family to Lubbock in 1969, his dark side reemerged when he was arrested for again exposing himself. He was only admitted to a psych ward for nine months and his first wife got tired of his annex, so she divorced his butt. 
All he learned at the psych ward is how to pick up underage girls by practicing on the patients that were admitted there. He dated one 16-year-old but says he didn't make love to her because I was already in enough trouble with the law. I didn't want statutory R-word on top of the flasher charge. Next, he seduced a 17-year-old psych patient in room 417, according to Bell. As soon as Ed was released, now 31-year-old Ed married again, this time to a 20-year-old named Debbie, a fellow patient he had met in the hospital, and they moved to Galveston, where they rented an apartment right on the beach. In 1970, he became part owner at a little surf shop. Several of the victims from the killing fields frequented this shop, including Maria and Debbie. They had been at Wicks just down the block from Ed's apartment skiing the day before they vanished. Remember the white van Maria and Debbie had been picked up in? Well, just a few months after the two girls were murdered in February 1972, Ed was again picked up for exposing himself to yet another young girl. This time he was in Louisiana and the arresting officer recorded the type of vehicle Ed drove that day as a 1971 white Ford van. He later would repaint the van and then it would mysteriously burn. Yeah, that's not fishy at all. In 1974, Ed was busted twice in Galveston County. In April, he exposed himself to two girls and pursued them in a Volkswagen rental as they ran. What a weirdo. He next was arrested for the R-word of a Jeannie Seeley mental patient whom he says he met outside the hospital. Both cases were dropped. Between 72 to 78, several more girls were murdered around the area. On August 24, 1978, Ed pulled up in front of a house in Pasadena, Texas, southeast of Houston. On the street, Ed spied a group of children playing. He got out of a red and white GMC pickup, nude from the waist down, and began playing with himself. The girls screamed, and a 26-year-old vet recently home from the service, Larry Dickens, heard his mother Dorothy calling the police. The former Marine shouted at Ed, hoping to detain the men until police arrived. Dickens ran to Ed's truck and grabbed the keys out of the ignition. Furious, Ed retrieved a 22 from inside of his pickup, and he shot Dickens four times in the chest. Somehow, Dickens managed to run toward the garage, wounded but trying to escape with his life. Inside the house, Dickens' mother again called police, pleading for help, while outside her son staggered down the driveway before collapsing. Ed grabbed a high-powered R-I-F-L-E in his pickup and walked back up to the driveway. As Dickens pleaded for his life, Ed straddled the ex-Marine and pulled the trigger. Larry's teenage sister, Donna, pulled up just in time to see Ed fire that fatal shot. 20 minutes later, after a car chase and a gun battle, police had Ed secured in the back of a squad car. They drove him to the Dickens' house where Donna and her mother identified him as the man who had killed Larry. Astonishingly, his lawyers posted bond and Ed was out of jail in 24 hours. And guess what? Not surprisingly, he went on the run. Ed was not captured again until 1992. No joke. 1992. And the only reason he was captured was because of a show called Unsolved Mysteries. And that led to tips of him being in Panama City living with a new wife. Ed received a 70-year sentence. Two years later, he would write the letters in which he admits to the crimes. He wrote that he had murdered 11 girls, five in 1971 and six more in the mid to late 70s. In this letter, the self-described serial killer said he'd shot Debbie and Maria. Debbie in the neck and the head and Maria in the neck or back. At the time, he said he stood above the teenagers on a small bridge. Their hands and feet were bound in front with nylon strings. Knowledge of these facts, he maintained, proved he was a killer. Yet he added that if he was ever brought into a courtroom, he would plead not guilty, laying the blame on the brainwashing program. During the interview, Ed went into further details about the program, as he called it, saying it started with his grandfather, who he suspected personally knew President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The goal, Ed said, was to experiment with a good kid, subject him to abuse and manipulation to toy with his psychology, and determine if he could be made bad. First step in Ed's definition of turning to the dark side included becoming gay. And the final step centered on belief in a higher being. The treatment, Ed said, began when he was a toddler and in each stage 
seemed to have been intertwined with S.E.X. At three, he described taking his clothes off, implying show and tell with the little girl. The episode was interrupted by Ed's mother, who beat him with a stick. Ed contended that the beatings, accompanied by not being fed, forced his endocrine system into overdrive, pumping out hormones. He claimed this made him over S.E.X. Looking back, he said he knew from early on that his drive was exceptional. As a teenager, he played with himself five or six times a day. At 15, he claimed his father, an oil field worker, hired a hitman to kill him. The reason why? Do you really want to know the reason why? A little disturbing, but I'll tell you. He said his father wanted to kill him because he was getting it on with the farm animals. He stated that it was one regret that he hadn't turned the tables on his father by murdering him. He stated that the program kept building inside of him. It built and built until one day it just blew. He said that he exploded and it caused him to do bad things. Then during the interview, he'd say his letters were lies, that he had never really killed anyone, not even the Marine Larry Dickens. He admitted to picking up Debbie and Maria and claimed he did not kill them, though. Here's a piece of that interview. When did you start flashing girls? When I was about 25 years old, I became a flasher. Where did you meet the girls that you flashed? Well, wherever they were. There was probably a thousand of them or so. What made you do that? What made you flash? That's a real good question. I think I had a very hyperactive hormone system. I think my testosterone level was very, very high. I've had six wives. To only one of them have I been legally married. And that was a girl down in Panama. Why did you send letters to the district attorneys in Galveston and Harris County? Uh, I very stupidly thought they would kill me. I thought I could confess to some crimes that I didn't commit and the state would kill me. I was suicidal. In those letters, you mentioned two girls, or several girls, Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson. Right. Let How me... did you know Debbie and Maria? These girls came running up and flagged me down and jumped in my van. But okay. they knew you. They knew you. Mm, I don't think they knew me. They knew of me. I told them I'm on my way to work. They let me know almost immediately that they were tired of going to bed with young high school kids. They wanted a guy like me. I told them, great. Okay, and I told them that I was part owner of Doug's Dive and Surf Shop on Stewart Road. And I, had a, I set up a meeting with them for Saturday morning at 10. I didn't work Saturdays and Sundays. And it was quite obvious we were going to get a motel room and jump in bed together. Kill Debbie Ackerman and Maria no, Johnson. No, I did not. Did I had them in my van. Them? I let them out at the Martini Theater and with the setup for Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Did you have sex with them? No, no. But you confessed to their murders. Right, right. But Why? I did not, so that the state would kill me. I was suicidal at that time. During this interview, he was 72 years old and said he no longer had sexual urges like he used to. He told the interviewer that when he dies, I want you to tell them to bury me nude in the casket. I'm an old flasher, so I want to be nude. And I want to be face down. That way, when all those people who don't like me walk by the casket, they can kiss my ass. Galveston prosecutors refused to present Ed's written confession to a grand jury, even though those letters included details that line up eerily well with the facts of the case. Harris County prosecutors never investigated the claims and subsequently lost the letters. And Ed refused to cooperate with police, and as you can see, later denied the claims he made in the letter. Now these claims will go forever unanswered, with DNA that was impossible to recover from some of the evidence, which had been collected years ago, and also the fact that Edward Howard Bell collapsed in prison and passed away in 2019. Ed was 82 years old at the time of his death. Maybe in the end, the program, as he called it, ended up taking his life. Unfortunately for the 11 victims, family and friends of the 11 in Heaven serial killer, no true answers will ever officially be known. But with the details that Edward Bell wrote in the letters, 
I believe we all suspect he was a disturbing, sadistic serial killer and only one of many serial killers on the Texas killing fields. All right, guys, I will see you next time in the murder she shed. Y'all have a blessed week and a happy Christmas. I am going to have one more episode. It's going to be a kind of a Christmas episode. So I will see y'all one more time for this blessed Christmas week. So whatever, have a great Christmas and I will see you later. Okay, I filmed this earlier in the day and I really screwed it up. So here I am filming again. So if my bloopers look a little different, wearing a hat, not wearing a hat. And night I can't wear a hat, so I had to actually kind of fix my hair the best I could. She wore only a pink bra under a maroon, maroon, maroon. Let's try that again. She thought my and his first wife just got tired of this, all these annex and divorced him. Ugh, yeah, I would too. Him sitting there exposing himself to little girls. That's just disturbing and disgusting. And I don't blame her for leaving Ed. Ed, that's horrible. I just felt like saying that. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to add all that. And her stomach's overlapping her pants. Mine already is, but it really will be then. I've gained too much weight lately. I need to lose. And how can you possibly lose with pecan pie sitting around? Pecan pie and coconut are my absolute favorite. Oh my God, that's heaven. In fact, I made a coconut the other day. I made two. I'm not going to lie. I need a whole pie right on my own. I eat every slice on my own. Because my husband was away for a few days. When he came back, he's like, you eat the whole pie? Well, who else do you think is going to eat it? My boys don't ever hardly show up anymore. I'm here by myself with the dogs. And I'm not going to feed the dogs coconut pie. So who else, who else could have eat that pie? I mean, come on. Somebody had to eat it. It couldn't just sit around here. But anyway, I ate a whole freaking pie. I really did. That's embarrassing, but I did. And then my husband came home, and he better not lie, because he ate the whole freaking other pie I made. He cannot lie about that, because I waited, and I didn't eat a single piece. So I could say, hey, dude, you eat a whole pie, too. Don't look at me like that. And he ate the whole other pie. Yes, he did. So, gotcha, honey. My I don't know if here, but there's a lot of interrupting. A loud interrupting. A loud plane interrupting my video right now. It's super loud. Gotta wait for it to go by. Sorry about this. We will play some music as I let it go by. Mm-hmm. What kind of music is that? I don't know. What kind of song could it play? Baby Got Back. Baby Got Back. I don't know. I have no, no tune to any song. I suck at singing. I was not made for singing, so therefore I'll just talk because you don't want to hear me sing or hum probably so i think it finally went by so y'all have looked out we can begin the video again an older gentleman decided to spend his day i sound pissed when i started it <sighs> i'm not quite done okay i'm almost done i'm almost done bubba say bye say bye baby. say bye no not yet not yet bubba you're so pushy sometimes you're so pushy boy you're a pushy boy you know that he is pushy Got fish breath. I even breath smell fishy. You need a dental mitt, dude. I gotta finish this, okay? Go lay down. Go lay down. Go lay down. Also, I've actually started building my rabbit cage. I'm trying to make it cute. I want rabbits to have a cute home. Like I said, I have two rabbits, and I decided what their name's gonna be: Harley Bunny and Honey Bunny. I know, goofy, but I like it. Harley and Honey. And I already had Sam, Simon tell y'all bye, so gonna end the video right here and I uh, love y'all and I hope y'all like I said have a great week and bless others out there be a blessing to others love others not too much though you don't want to look like a weirdo just you know what I mean just love them in a good way not in a bad way I don't know where all this is going all right Whenever I'm together with the dog bucks crawling Praise to the man who stands so fighting, fight so fight.